Lord, I pray that um, knowing that you are present to us already, help us to be aware of your presence this morning, help to bring us together through screens and state lines and many miles, um, be that unifying presence for us as we seek to experience um, your heart today. Um, thank you for your scriptures that reveal your heart uh, for the life of your son and for many uh, saints who've come before who testify to the beauty of your heart. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, as many of you all know, um, we are currently in the season of Epiphany, and this is the season in the church calendar where uh, we remember how Jesus reveals his true identity to all the world. And so it seemed right and fitting for us to spend this time this morning digging into and praying into this question, who is this Jesus who revealed himself to us? To put it another way, what is Jesus like? What is his heart, his innermost being actually like? A.W. Tozer once wrote that what comes into our minds when we think about God, when we imagine God, is the most important thing about us. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes into your mind when you think about God? What comes into my mind? I've certainly been thinking about this a lot recently, not only in preparation for this morning, but also in light of the terrible things that happened on January 6th. The attack on the Capitol and um, the many Jesus saves, Jesus 2020 flags and t-shirts and chants, um, they speak to a particular vision of God, I think. And I was even uh, fortunate or unfortunate enough to stumble upon a recording of a prayer that happened in the Senate chambers led by um, some of the mob. And I was struck, I will go ahead and post a link to the video that has that. I won't go into all the details, which are, uh, you know, sobering and chilling in a lot of ways, but you're welcome to explore that later. Um, but a tagline that seemed to come back again and again as the man who was praying was going through his prayer, it seemed like every time he had came to a new thought, he repeated this phrase, thank you, divine, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent creator God. And as he said that several times throughout his prayer, I was struck by how focused that was, how, how particularly that articulated what God is to the expense or without much reference to who God is. And I can't help but wonder how having a more deeply rooted felt understanding of who God is at his core, as we learn from the scriptures and the life of Jesus, how that might have flowed out of their lives, out of our lives into the world um, in different ways than we saw on display that day. So to help us have an encounter with this heart of Christ this morning, we're going to take a prayerful walk through a few key ideas, scriptures, and quotes from this book. It's called Gentle and Lowly, The Heart of Christ for Sinners and Sufferers. It's a wonderful book by Dane Ortland um, that came out last year. I'll uh, post a little bit about that in the chat. And... I encourage you to pick it up. It's got a lot of treasures um, to, uh, to di di dive into, and um, I'm not gonna be able to cover them all this morning, as you might imagine, but um, I hope that you will. But for our purposes, we will start our time this morning with the verse that uh, Ortland uses for the title of his book. It comes from the end of Matthew 11. This comes after Jesus has finished um, a kind of whirlwind teaching and healing tour of Galilee. He has just uh, encountered some confused disciples of John the Baptist and 
directs them to his prophecy fulfilling resume of miraculous works to answer their questions. He has just explained to the gathered masses once the disciples, those disciples leave the significance of John's ministry in the grand sweep of God's project of revelation and redemption. And then he calls out all of the hard hearted cities who uh, where he had just visited where his abundant miracles produce no repentance in the population. So those things happen all before we get to this passage. And um, I'm going to share the screen. I'm going to read this and um, we'll see that after those things happen in chapter 11, uh, Jesus breaks into a spontaneous prayer. That's what we're reading. It's this really amazing revelation of his intimacy with God the Father. It reveals the upside down nature of the kingdom that Jesus is bringing. And crucially for us this morning, it also offers us a glimpse into his very heart. In fact, it is the only time in the gospels where Jesus describes in his own words, his innermost being. So let's pay attention to that. And as I read this passage, I invite you to enter, enter this story with all of your senses. Um, so settle yourself, calm yourself, perhaps remove any distractions that, that you can. <laughs> um, and imagine yourself in that huddled, probably dusty and sweaty crowd. Imagine what you are carrying into that moment. What hopes, what fears, what questions, what longings. Imagine what it would be like to have the curtain drawn back, even if just for a moment, into that deepest reality of God's inner life. So let's begin. Matthew eleven twenty-five 25 through 30. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Pause. Can you imagine being present for such a soaring declaration of the divinity and uniqueness of this Jesus. He addresses the Lord of heaven and earth as his father, who he seems to know intimately. In fact, he claims that this father gave him authority and dominion over everything, over all things, and that no one is able to come to know the father unless he, Jesus, chooses to reveal the father to them. I know if I were there at this point, I might be wondering who in the world would be worthy of such a privilege, of such access to this Father? Who will Jesus choose to reveal the Father to? Who are Jesus's people going to be? Well, we're not left in doubt. Jesus goes on. And after I read this next bit, I will give us some time to let his words steep in our hearts. And then I have a few questions for us. So we, Jesus continues after that soaring declaration of his divinity, his uniqueness. This is what he says. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Let's, let's let that soak in into our hearts for a little while.
Now I have some questions for us to reflect on together in light of this passage. Um, so if you have a piece of paper or a notebook, or perhaps you just want to hold your responses out in front of you, you can open your hands and do it that way, or just hold them in your mind. Um, but I would ask, what are you carrying today? What burdens are you shouldering this morning? They might be present or past sins, present or past sufferings, fears, anxieties, longings. I invite you to hold those out to God this morning. However you see fit, we'll spend a minute um, doing that. The next question, how are you tempted to imagine Jesus relative to your burdened self? Let's spend a moment to be honest with ourselves and with God, how we are viewing him today. Do we feel that he is aloof to us, that he might be disappointed in us? Perhaps we see him as vengeful even, or simply nagging or something else. How are you tempted to imagine Jesus relative to your burdened self this morning? We'll spend another minute thinking about that. All right, let us look a little bit closer at this phrase, I am gentle and lowly in heart. In his own analysis of these verses, Dane Ortland elaborates on the different resonances between these two different descriptors. Jesus is gentle in heart. That means that Jesus is not trigger happy. He's not harsh, reactionary easily exasperated. He is the most understanding person in the universe. The posture most natural to him is not a pointed finger, but open arms. Jesus is lowly. This signifies that Jesus is accessible for all his resplendent glory and dazzling holiness, his supreme uniqueness and otherness. Remember those first three verses that we read earlier? No one in human history has ever been more approachable than Jesus Christ. One of the last things that we can learn from this passage, another thing at least, is we learn who qualifies for fellowship with Jesus. We were wondering who would Jesus choose to give access to the Father? Um, who would he choose? And we see the qualifications here. All who labor and are heavy laden. This means that you don't need to unburden or collect yourself and then come to Jesus. In fact, your very burden is what qualifies you to come. I found this to be one of the treasures of Gentle and Lowly, this book, and it's how Ortland draws deeply from the wells of Puritan pastors and theologians to help us sink more deeply into this unflagging reality of God's heart. So for the next few minutes, I'll offer us space to reflect on three of these quotes. 
I will read the quote and then I will leave the quote up on the screen. I invite you to post in the chat the phrases or images that strike you as you read and listen. You are also free not to do that, but I invite you to do it if you want to. May our hearts and imaginations be shaped to better behold our gentle and lowly savior through these past saints. So often we are tempted to feel that our sins change God's disposition towards us. We can imagine an angry, wrathful God glowering down at us as we stumble around. And to that image, we go to our first quote from Thomas Goodwin. In fact, your very sins move him to pity more than anger. Christ takes part with you. He takes your side and is so far from being provoked against you as all his anger is turned upon your sin to ruin it. Yes, his pity is increased the more towards you, even as the heart of a father is to a child that has some loathsome disease, or as one is to a member of his body that has leprosy. He hates not the member, for it is his flesh, but the disease, and that provokes him to pity the part affected the more. So as we see in this quote, our sins are what caused Jesus to move towards us more eagerly. And next we turn to John Bunyan, someone who captures beautifully, I think, the jaw-dropping reality of who God chooses to associate himself with. So here is John Bunyan. It is common for equals to love and for superiors to be beloved, but for the King of princes and for the son of God, for Jesus Christ to love man thus, this is amazing. And that's so much more for that the man, for that man, the object of his love is so low, so mean, so vile, so undeserving and so inconsiderable as by the scriptures everywhere he is described to be. Love in him, love in Jesus, is essential to his being. God is love. Christ is God. Therefore, Christ is love. Love naturally. He may as well cease to be as cease to love. Love from Christ requires no taking beauteousness in the object to be beloved. It can act of and from itself. With all, without all such kinds of dependencies, the Lord Jesus sets his heart to love them. I'll scroll back through that quote slowly. Finally, we're going to return to Goodwin, who riffs on Paul's description of God in 2 Corinthians as the father of mercies and what that means for our broken lives in this broken world. And as I read this, think back 
to that list of burdens that you made for yourself and presented to God earlier today? What does it mean that God is the father of mercies relative to those, to that list? Here's Thomas Goodwin. God has a multitude of all kinds of mercies. As our hearts and the devil are the father of a variety of sins, so God is the father of variety of mercies. There is no sin or misery, but God has a mercy for it. He has a multitude of mercies of every kind. As there are variety of miseries which the creature is subject unto, so he has in himself a shop, a treasury of all sorts of mercies. If your heart be hard, his mercies are tender. If your heart be dead, he has mercy to liven it. If you be sick, he has mercy to heal you. If you be sinful, he has mercies to sanctify and cleanse you. As large and as various are, your, as are our wants, so large and various are his mercies. So we may come boldly to find grace and mercy to help us in time of need, a mercy for every need. All the mercies that are in his own heart, he has transplanted into several beds in the garden of the promises where they grow. And he has abundance of variety of them suited to all the variety of diseases of the soul. Let's reflect back on that as, it, as I scroll through slowly. So as we move to close, I have one final question for us. What does the gentle and lowly heart of Christ have to do with the hearts and lives of those who are called to be his hands and feet in the world? In other words, if the point of the Christian life is, as C.S. Lewis and many others have said similar things, to become little Christ's in Christ's deepest essence is gentle and lowly, compassionate, merciful, sacrificially loving. What then for you and for me? Let's take a moment to ask God to bring to our mind some ways, some areas in which we have room to grow in Christ heartedness. And then I'll close us in a minute. Pray with me. Dear God, Father of mercies and Lord of all comfort, may we be attentive to your heart of love inside and all around us today. Wherever our hearts are hard, may we experience your tenderness. Where our hearts are dead, enliven them. If any of us are sick or suffering, heal us and make us well where we are not radiating with the love that is naturally yours, help us to return to you 
knowing that you are as eager to receive us today as you were yesterday and you will be tomorrow. May our lives be so securely rooted in your love that we can move with you towards the brokenness we encounter around us with joy and without fear. Amen.